Hi, I'm Sam Ben Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Silicon Carbide Diode Capacitance. We have now two types of diodes, rectifiers for high frequency. There is the PN junction type diode, for example, the silicon diode, which is very popular, which is uh, built around a junction between N and P semiconductor material. And then we have a Schottky type diode, which is a diode between a metal and a semiconductor. Now the silicon diode, say the NP diode, has characteristically a problem of reverse recovery. That is, when we switch the direction of the current, it will flow in the other direction for a while until the charge carriers in the junction area are actually swept out. So we have a time here in which we have a reverse current which causes a lot of problems. On the other hand, in the case of the Schottky type diode, which is, which is between the metal and the semiconductor, there is practically no reverse recovery type of a phenomena because there is no junction between N and P. However, there is some capacitance which is characterized, I'm showing it here just a parallel capacitance, that's not exactly the case. Also, this capacitance is non-linear, we'll talk about it. In any event, this case, uh, as we reverse the current or the voltage across the diode, uh, there is very little reverse current, mainly because of this capacitance. So the focus here is on the effect of this capacitance on a DC to DC or any other switch mode converter. So let's have a look at a uh, commercial uh, silicon carbide diode. This is an example of a Cree diode. This is just an example. There are many other companies who are making uh, silicon carbide Schottky diodes. This is just for the demonstration. And this is a pretty heavy diode. It's a 50 amp diode, 650 volt reverse voltage. And the parameters that we are really interested in are shown here. We are talking about capacitance, and as you'll see, there are a number of capacitances here, depending on the uh, voltage, the reverse voltage. Um, for zero voltage, we have about, uh, it's about two nanofarad, 200 volts in 200 picofarad, and then 400 volts in 180 farad. So this is a nonlinear capacitance. We'll see the plot of it. And then there is a total capacitance charge We'll talk about it also. Uh, this is given for 400 volt, uh, 50 amp forward current, and a certain DIDT, that is the rate at which the current is dropping. And there is also uh, the energy stored in this capacitance, 16.5 microjoule. This is for 400 volt. This capacitor is non-linear and we can see it here. This is capacitance as a function of voltage. This is, however, an incremental capacitance. So the way that this capacitance is being measured is by exposing a diode, say, uh, this is the diode, to a small signal plus a DC voltage in the reverse direction. This is an AC voltage and it says here that 25 millivolt at 1 megahertz. For each voltage here, uh, and this is the voltage, the capacitance is being measured by measuring the current and uh, knowing the AC voltage and AC current. And these are the points. Here we have this about you know, 2 nanofarads. And then it goes down quite a bit. At, say, uh, at the end, the 650 volt, it's about 180 picofarads. So this is the incremental capacitance. On the other hand, we have another plot here. Uh, this one is a charge stored in the capacitance as a function of the voltage. Again, this is the voltage here, and here we have also, this is the voltage. Now the difference between these two, that this is charge, and this is incremental capacitance. In fact, this curve is the integral of this C is a function of V, this is this curve. Or you might say that this curve, that is the incremental capacitance, is the derivative here. 
at the beginning it's very high this is why this is a large capacitance and then it's going and tapering off and here this is in fact this capacitor so this is the information that is actually measured so this is the non-linear capacitance of the diode and we are going to see how this affects uh, the behavior of the diode when it is reversed bias. Let's first consider the issue of energy and charge. Okay, and here I'm showing a typical, say, a boost converter. Here's the diode. I'm showing the capacitor as just a parallel capacitor across the diode, just to explain what's going on. This is the input inductor, output section, filter capacitor load and I'm assuming that I'm going to have a MOSFET switch okay this is the assumption of this presentation this is a MOSFET switch now at the beginning there's no voltage here uh, at the gate so current is flowing this direction the diode is conducting and then we turn on the transistor by providing a positive pulse to the gate and what will happen of course is that this transistor will start conducting and we'll have a current first of all from the inductor but then also when this diode is reversed we're going to have a current flowing through this capacitor to the transistor okay so the first question that i'm posing here how much energy is involved in this uh, process as far as the diode or the capacitance of the diode is concerned and how much energy or power loss is associated with it. So let's assume that this particular diode has a total Q of 110, this is from the data sheet, and let's see the output voltage is 400 volt and let's say, say that we are switching at 100 kilohertz. Energy is Q times V and then times frequency, this is going to be the power. So what we are getting here is, this is the Q is 10 to about 10 to the minus uh, 7, uh, 400, 10 to the fifth, about 4 watts. So this is the energy that is come, or this is the power in fact, that coming out of, say V out, this direction. Now not all of this power is dissipated uh, by the transistor. Part of it is stored in this capacitor. Now since this is a nonlinear capacitor and since that at high voltage the capacitance is fairly uh, small then the amount of charge is not very high. In any event not all of these four watts are dissipated in this transistor. If it would have been a linear capacitor we know that in, in a linear capacitor the total energy that comes out from a source that is charging a capacitor is CV square. Half of it is left within the capacitor and then the same amount is dissipated. So you might say that just the approximation about half of this value will be dissipated say in the transistor. That's really not very much. Uh, so this is not a very big problem as far as uh, power loss is concerned with a, a silicon carbide diode. This is a pretty heavy diode. Uh, it's a 50 amp, so that's quite a bit of a uh, charge in stored here. But then there is another question, which is kind of very intriguing, and this is the following. If we look at this boost converter, we have here a inductor, a diode, and let's just say that this is a switch. And then when this uh, switch is turned on, well, we feel that there is a problem here because you connect a, a capacitor to ground and there is a voltage here, so you sort of expect a big spike. And the question is, how big is this spike? And will it harm the transistor? And um, is it really a problem? Well, let me just say already this is really not the case. And the reason is that we don't have a switch here. This is a MOSFET. And the behavior of a MOSFET is, is entirely different from a switch. Uh, 
by intuition we feel that this uh, MOSFET sort of uh, goes from cut off, no conduction, and then goes into a conduction with some RDS on. But this is not the case. There is a process of switching between one state to the other that I'm going to elaborate in this particular um, video presentation that we have here. So to begin with, let's just look at the relationship between the drain current and VGS of a MOSFET transistor. Typically, it'll be something like this. Now, this is temperature dependent and also depends on the voltage of the drain, VDS. Uh, but I'm going to simplify matters just to get, gain an understanding of the processes which are going on here. So I'm going to approximate it by this straight line. That is, there's a break point here, there's no current here, and then it starts off. This is like the threshold voltage of the MOSFET. And then it's a straight line with the slope of GM, which is the transconductance. So I'm going to represent the MOSFET by this very simple model, which includes the dependent current source. This is this expression. IM is the actual current through this channel, through the MOSFET. And then I'm going to add this capacitance between gate and drain, CGD, which turns out to be a pivotal point here in this uh, process. That is, this is a very, very important parameter, very important element in the switching process. So this is the simplified MOSFET model. I am not including here this capacitance here between gate and source and not the output capacitance. This is just for looking at the issue of the silicon carbide capacitance, silicon carbide capacitance and how it affects the transistor. So here we have it. We have now, a, again, this is like a boost stage. We have an inductor. This is the diode. This is again representing the capacitance of the silicon carbon diode. And here is the MOSFET, which I am representing by this simplified model. This is drain, gate, and source. And now we have just turned on or attempting to turn on the transistor, and uh, from zero we have some input voltage, this is the pulse coming in, of V sub G. There is a series resistance, very important, RG, uh, in this part. So what's going to happen, of course, is that the voltage of the gate will start rising, but if it doesn't hit the threshold, then nothing really happens, except for this VGS going up. Uh, the diode current will be the same, everything is the same, there's no output voltage. The drain voltage is the output voltage because the current passing through the diode is clamping this point to V out within the voltage drop of the diode, and uh, the, this is uh, the current is the inductor current, so, and the transistor doesn't conduct. This IM is this current here. So nothing happens. But once this point is hit, then of course, here it is, um, current starts flowing within this transistor, through the channel, and the, at the same time, the current of the diode is dropping because we are sort of stealing this current from here, the sum of these is the inductor current, which is a, about constant, like a current source. And so once this transistor is conducting, then proportionally the current of the diode is dropping, and we see it here. And still, we are still clamped to the output because uh, there is some forward current and uh, there is a, a clamping effect of this point to the V out. But now, we have just reached the point that the current through here equals the inductor current. And I'm going to even simplify now matters by saying that this inductor current is just like a current source. I'm assuming that the change in the current throughout this process is very small. So this is like a current source. I've eliminated the diode because it doesn't make 
any difference now. The current is flowing through the capacitance. The, there's no forward current, of course. And this is just balanced. That is, this, cur this current over the inductor plus the capacitance plus, very important, the gate current are equal to this um, channel current. So the transistor now is sort of absorbing all these currents, uh, these three currents, and very importantly, also this IG current, okay? So the voltage of the drain will stop dropping. And the question I'm asking here is, first of all, what kind of a drop do I expect? And also the question is, what will be the current of this capacitance? Remember that we said that this is not like a switch. If it would have been a switch, then we would have had a very sharp spike. But this is not a switch. It's a different type of uh, process going on here. So let's have a look what's going on. An important relationship that I'm starting with is the state space equation of a capacitor, which states that the capacitor current is equal to the capacitance times dv dt, that is the rate at which the voltage is dropping. Now obviously the rate at which this voltage is dropping here is equal for these two capacitances, because I'm assuming that at this stage I'm just about at the conduction point of this gate of this transistor and throughout this process the current is not changing much so therefore there is no need for VGS to change much so this is just about a constant voltage this is a constant voltage so therefore the gate current is about constant so we have a gate current coming in we have this current and this current and let's see now what are the relationships here so we are saying that the VDT is the same for the two capacitors. Now, the VDT here is in fact, and this is very important to realize, is determined by IG and CGD. Well, the reason is the following. This is, as we said, a pretty constant voltage. There is a current flowing here, so therefore, the voltage across this capacitor is changing at a rate which is determined by IG over CGS, CGD. This is from here. The VDT is I over C. This is the C. This is the current. So what is really dropping the voltage here is this capacitor and this current. This, is, this current is just getting along. And again, because the VDT is the same for these two, so therefore, and I can find here that the current of this capacitor over the current of this capacitor, which is IG, is the ratio between these capacitors. Very interesting. So the current that is flowing this, through this diode capacitance is determined by IG and the ratio of this capacitor. Obviously, in general cases, this capacitor might be larger than this one, so therefore this current will be larger than this one by this proportion. So here we have it. These currents are related by the value of the capacitances. Now, the current of the channel is equal to the sum of all these currents, now, since these are related, I can write it in this form. So I have that the channel current is the inductor current plus the gate current plus one plus CS over CGD. This is the, in fact, the capacitance, diode capacitance current. I have another relationship of IG, which is the difference between the voltages uh, divided by RG. And I'm also having this relationship that this is approximate a model of the MOSFET GM times VGS minus T. Using all these, I can actually find an analytical expression for the current, which I'm not going to do in this presentation because my 
uh, objective here is really to explain in an intuitive way what is going on and whoever wants to do this derivation can do it very easily. What we can now conclude is the following. We have a current through the capacitor, the diode capacitor, which is related to this current and the values of this capacitor. This is this equation. The voltage is dropping linearly because this is about a constant current. The voltage across this CGD is changing linearly. And so this is what we see here. Very interesting. So we can now continue this process by saying that once we started once we, we enter this delicate balance, that is the diode is not conducting anymore. So uh, I have it here, this diode is forward not conducting. The current of the channel is now supporting all these current, this plus this current. VGS is about constant for the reason that I've said. This capacitance current of the diode is about constant because it is related to this constant Ig and the voltage of the drain is dropping linearly. This is what's going to happen. And then I am now move to the next stage. The, once I reach ground here, that's the end of this switching process. The current here will be just the inductor current because there's no current here and no current here because there will be no change anymore. And if there is no change um, in this capacitance, there is no current here. So we are moving the channel current to IL. This is the inductor current. VGS will start rising again because um, we have been on the sort of approximately the threshold, a little bit above it, so uh, VG is higher than this threshold, so therefore there'll be another discharge, but then this, this is just a, a passive discharge of this capacitor plus uh, this capacitor, which I'm not showing between gate and source, and um, it doesn't affect anymore the current because uh, we are already at the uh, RDS on state that this is just like a uh, small resistance. And um, of course here we are going not to have any more current because there is no change here and we have reached just about the potential of ground. So this is the picture that I would expect. Now I'm going to show you a simulation of this situation. Actually it's a two-step uh, simulation. First of all, I'll assume that the capacitance of the diode is fixed, that is, it's it linear, that is, does, it's not voltage dependent as the real capacitance is. Now, I've put this capacitance here in this circuit, the reason for it, for which is that I like it to affect only the reverse direction. So only when you have a reverse current, it'll go through this this is like an ideal diode. So when, it, when the current is reversing, it goes through here. The purpose of this RS is to reset the, uh, this like a snubber, to reset the voltage of the CS so it'll be ready for the next stage. So when uh, this transistor doesn't conduct, then the current goes this way through the uh, resistor and it's discharging this capacitor so it's ready for the next switching. Now I've used here a model of a transistor. It's an ICES transistor. Again, this is just an example, just to, for demonstration. And this is a, again, a heavy transistor because we are talking about heavy currents here. And um, this transistor has everything in it, uh, including this capacitance. So I'm not putting it in because it's uh, supposed to be the model. I hope it's okay. I haven't checked the model very carefully, but it looks okay. And then I have this um, uh, resistor at the input, and this is uh, the output stage uh, of this uh, very simple, say, uh, 
boost conversion. So we have also to take into account that we don't see the channel current. Uh, in this uh, simulation, I can see this current, uh, which is uh, the channel current minus IG, because as we understand, um, inside we have both this current as well as this current. Also, we have a current of the uh, output capacitance, which I'm neg neglecting. So this is really approximate. Don't, don't take it uh, to be very accurate. So this is the transistor th from this uh, library. By the way, I'm using the demo SPICE, which is free, and it includes this model of this transistor. So let's see what we got. So this is the circuit, and this is the simulation. Let's go over it. Let's start with VDS, and as we see, it's really going down pretty linear, okay, as we expect. We see it here. VGS, voltage here, during this process is about constant. It's going up a little bit because the current is going up a little bit, so, but then it's, it's pretty constant, then it sort of goes up again. This is the initial rise in which uh, there was no current, okay? This is the ID now. And uh, what we see here is that at the beginning, as we hit the threshold, it starts to go up. And then, as we expected, it sort of levels off because all these current, this one, this one, and this one are about the constant, having a VGS about constant. And uh, the diode, of course, uh, at this uh, stage, the voltage of the diode is uh, dropping. This is the reverse voltage. This is actually the capacitance voltage. This is just a, this and these are just about the same. And this is the current of the capacitance, this one, which exhibits itself as the current here, of course. This is just this portion here without this one. And as we see, um, this is the forward current of the diode. And then it drops down to zero and then goes negative because now we are having current through this capacitor and it's pretty much a constant and then it tapers off. Let's just remember that this simulation is assuming that this CS is linear. That is a fixed capacitor, non-voltage uh, dependent, which is, of course, not the case with the real silicon carbide. Uh, we'll see a simulation with a variable capacitor. So this is pretty much the picture that we would expect. Now, going back to the data sheet, let's uh, refresh ourselves with um, this information of this change of the capacitance as a function of voltage. We see that at low reverse voltage on the diode, the capacitance is very high. And then it goes down to pretty low value. So at the very beginning, we have a large capacitance. And according to the analysis I did, here, we are going to expect a high capacitor, capacitance current, because the current is related to the gate current, and the gate current is about constant, and the ratio of the, this capacitance to the CGD between gate and drain uh, is very high, so it's going to be a high current. But then it's supposed to taper off, because the capacitance is going down, the ratio between these capacitance is going lower and lower. In fact, it's probably around one here for this particular case. So therefore, you'd expect to see a high current at the beginning, which is going down. So this is what would, we would expect uh, from the analysis I did and the behavior of this nonlinear capacitor. Okay. So let's see what we would expect now in this case that the capacitor is nonlinear. And in, I'm showing here the sort of the type of nonlinearity. At the beginning, low voltage, it's high capacitance, and then it tapers off to a very low capacitance. 
So we have this capacitance going on. We are at the balance point at which this current equals to this plus the capacitor current. This diode is not conducting. I'm talking about this case here, that the current of the forward current dropped to zero. We see just the capacitance current. So we understand now that we are going to have a input current, gate current. This voltage will not change much, so this current is about constant, so therefore the drop is supposed to be constant. Here it is. This is the voltage drop of the drain, and the current here is constant, but this current is related to this current by the ratio of these capacitances, but now this capacitor is very high at the beginning, or very large at the beginning, so therefore the current here is much larger, and I'm showing here this current here. This was the case before with the fixed capacitor here. The capacitance is large, so it's going shooting up to a high value, peaking value, and then it drops down because this capacitance is becoming smaller and smaller. Of course, we're going to see this current at the channel of this transistor, and here it is now as compared to what was before, and perhaps the gate will go up a little bit to accommodate the higher uh, channel current. Okay, so this is what I'd expect to see in this particular case that this uh, capacitor is nonlinear. So I did a simulation of this case in which I've put here a voltage dependent capacitor according to the behavior seen in the data the plot of the data sheet of this uh, silicon carbide diode. I'm not going into detail because I like to keep it a brief and sort of intuitive, not too many details. So in this simulation now, this is a voltage dependent capacitor following the plot of the data sheet. And again, this is the same transistor as before, the ICES transistor. Again, the, this CGD is supposed to be internal. So what we see in this switching range, VDS, as expected, is going down just about in a constant rate. This is because this current is constant, and then the VDT is constant, so therefore this voltage is going linearly. The diode current is first of all the inductor current, and then it drops down, and here we see this peak that I was talking about, which of course we'll see it also at the drain. This is, we see this current going through the drain. So this is the drain. Uh, I don't know about the steps, it's some nonlinearity here. Let's forget it. This is the general behavior of this peak because of the higher capacitance and then it's tapering off. And something that I haven't mentioned, I'm also measuring here the total charge passing through this capacitor. And this is just by integrating the current through this capacitor. And this is this value, the maximum value. Now, for some reason, I'm getting a higher value than expected from the data sheet. The data sheet talks about 110 nanocoulomb. This is uh, coded into voltage, so this is coulombs, actually. So 110 will be somewhere here. I'm getting much higher. Interesting, for the linear case, I'm getting... Uh, with the diode, uh, with the capacitor, fixed capacitor that I've, I've put, I, I'm getting the right charge. So I don't know whether there is a problem with the simulation here, or maybe the data sheet uh, sort of uh, information is not accurate. Well, I really don't know about that. Anyhow, the behavior is really as expected uh, from the analysis I've just made. And this is for the case that uh, both of this capacitor and this are nonlinear. Of course, this is built within the model of the MOSFET, and this is what I've put in the simulation. Now, what about losses? Now, the loss, the switching loss is during this period of time when we have the drain voltage dropping and there is a drain current. Okay, the product of this is the energy lost in this 
time. Now, this simulation for this transistor and this uh, capacitance um, is with a resolution here, the simulation of 15 nanoseconds. This is this here. So we are talking about the switching time of about 15 nanoseconds. Now, if, say, the frequency, switching frequency 100 kilohertz, then this ratio is like 0.5%. So whatever uh, instant power you have here, you have to sort of dilute it by to within 0.5%, which is not so bad. Of course, if the frequency will be higher and higher, then you might have a problem of uh, power loss. Now, what can you do in order to lower the losses and improve the efficiency? Well, as we understand, the key is this drop here, which depends on what? Depends on the gate current and the value of this capacitance. So the higher the current that you have here and the lower CGD, the shorter will be this time. So the key, this is not new, we, we know that. We know that in order to improve with the switching, uh, you have to drive the gate with as high current as you can, and that choose a transistor with a CGD as small as you can find. So these are the key elements also here in order to get a uh, higher efficiency. So let me just wrap it up by showing a actual measurement, not by me, by On Semi. This is from some document by On Semi a company. This is uh, for a power factor correlation of about, that's a lower power that we have discussed. This is uh, 300 watts. Uh, and this is a MOSFET plus a silicon carbide diode. This is this side here, while this side is a regular fast silicon diode, okay? So what we see here is the voltage drop linearly. We see here this peak that we have seen in the simulation. Well, it looks a little bit different, but of course there's some oscillation, and the reason for the oscillation is that uh, the actual circuit has some inductance, which I have not put in my simulation, uh, because I just wanted to see the, the generic behavior. With an inductance, uh, you'll expect some oscillation to take place between, this is the resonant, network uh, composed of the inductance, the stray inductance, and the capacitance which are left in the circuit. So this explains this thing, but we see this peak here as before. Now this is not like a short circuit, like a switch on, on a capacitor. Well, there's sort of a controlled peak here, and then it goes down. In the case of a silicon diode, we see here actually the reverse recovery of the diode. It's a fairly high peak, okay? Again, uh, it's a 300 watts, so the, all the values are much lower. This is um, um, here, I guess it is uh, like 2 amp per division, so this is 3 amp, and this will be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 15, maybe 15 amp a peak here as compared to this peak which again uh, is controlled by, uh, as I've said, uh, the transistor uh, is, is not just a short on a capacitor. This brings me to the end of this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and it'll be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.